Welcome to Practical SVN for Programmers during Code Rage in 2018. My name is Mike Davis, and I'll be your guide today. This session will be a fast-paced tour aimed at assisting programmers interested in efficient version control for small worldwide teams. Some of our examples will use Delphi and Rubicon, but almost all of the information applies to Windows coders using any language. We have a big lineup for you today. We will cover the basics of subversion first, then we will dive in and deal with the nuts and bolts, the real-world skills you need to use subversion. The last two sections include advanced information, which is usually learned over weeks by trial and error. Our hope is that by sharing all these details, you can be up and running with subversion immediately and go on to write that awesome app the world is waiting for. Are you ready? Let's talk subversion. The letters S, V, N, stand for Subversion. Subversion is an open source software package intended to provide you with control over your file changes and software release cycles. It has been around since the year 2000. Excellent books and blog posts have been written about Subversion. The main Subversion book was published by O'Reilly during the early peak of SVN popularity. Since then, important new features have been added. You'll not easily find out about the new features by reading the primary documentation. They are adding features faster than the docs can keep up. Basically, you have to experiment with the software or keep watching this video. Version control software is quite essential for modern teams, especially when people cannot communicate all day long in real time. This can happen when people work in different offices, countries, or continents. Version control software provides an advantage to any person or team working with plain text files. As you make changes to your Delphi or C++ builder files or to your XML configuration files, you can use Subversion to use those iterative changes to a central location. Later, anyone on your team can look back on the history of changes and easily see who did what and when to which file. Subversion gives you an off-site backup of current files plus a full It is not a perfect metaphor, but the easiest way to think about how Subversion operates is with a client-server model. On Windows, the client side happens through a special integration with Windows File Explorer. Your client side files will be on your own disk, and their icons will be color-coded to let you know their status. A hidden directory stores information that links your files back to the central repo. The server side is provided by a host who specializes in subversion. This could be SourceForge, SFNet, or other open source projects. It is entirely possible to use subversion clients on Mac and Linux, but we won't be covering that today. It is to your benefit to use subversion only for suitable files and to skip over inappropriate ones. If you look at these lists, you might notice a theme. On the yes side, we have all plain text files or files that can be viewed with Notepad. On the No side, we have large binary files. Of course, it's up to you to decide the guidelines for your own projects. We try to stay under about a 20K limit for binary files. Why the big emphasis on plain text? The main idea has to do with the desire to automatically merge multiple changes from different people into a single source file. Imagine you are working on the Android branch of a project and you edit the first method in a particular Pascal file. Meanwhile, your friend is working on the iOS branch and modifies that last method of the same file. Both changes could be worthwhile, and software can automatically merge those changes from the two branches back into the main trunk at an opportune moment. With small teams, you rarely even need branches. In general, the file storage within a subversion repository is highly optimized. After you store a file once, only the modifications to that file are stored. Let's talk about two examples, Pascal code and piano music. You store a 20K Pascal file, then change one line of code, the total subversion storage will be just a tiny bit more than the initial 20K. However, if you record your daughter playing her first composition on the piano and you put her MP3 in subversion, and then she wants to re-record and store the next version, the server-side storage would end up being just about double the original size. When dealing with binary files like video, multimedia, and databases, the difference between the versions will not be detectable in a useful way, byte by byte. 
For this reason, we say that Subversion is ideal for plain text files. We will give you some very specific suggestions for storing your large binary files outside of Subversion. Part of why this matters is cost. There is a disk storage cost associated with large binaries. The Subversion host has to pass these costs on to the consumer. Most hosts have pricing that is based on how much space you use. If you can exclude your large binaries, you will save money every month. A little known fact is that even if you delete a file from your Subversion repo, the storage remains in use. Once you add the bloat of a large binary file, you can never recover the storage space in the same repository. The good news is that Subversion includes a feature for ignoring large binary files. Using Subversion Ignore, you can easily ignore binary files based on the file extensions or individual file names. If after watching this video, you want to use Subversion for your own projects, the easiest way is to let someone else take care of the hosting. If you are building an open source project with Delphi Community Edition, you can order your code on SourceForge for free. Down the track, if you change your mind and want to host yourself or with another provider, it is possible to use Subversion admin tools to remotely back up and restore between hosts. When that happens, you can keep all the history of the file changes and commit messages. The username might change to unknown or stay as they were. This depends on the details at the target host. For full control over users and permissions, host your own Subversion repository. The nickname for a Subversion database is a repo, short for the formal term repository. Support for server-side Subversion is much stronger on Linux than it is Windows. Client-side Subversion is what most programmers work with most of the time. Subversion itself is open source. If you wish, you can download the C code and compile it yourself, or you can use pre-compiled programs from Collabnet or Tortoise SVN. The standalone command line svn.exe from Collabnet is useful when building scripts that build up server appliances. The most popular Subversion client on Windows is one with a full-featured GUI called Tortoise SVN. This wonderful little product is actively maintained. Donations are encouraged. Now that you have an idea why you might want to use Subversion, let's have a look at how to install and configure the client side on Windows. Find the download link, use your favorite search engine, and look for the phrase Tortoise SVN or the phrase SVN Client for Windows. When installing, the one option that we strongly recommend you change from the defaults is to say yes, you do want the command line client tools. Tortoise SVN installs happily to the default location under C, Program Files, or to a lovely path on drive D without spaces. Your decision. If English is not your main language, look for a Tortoise SVN installer and manual in Hungarian, Portuguese, or German. Tortoise SVN is actively supported worldwide. When your Tortoise SVN setup is complete, you will find that your Windows File Explorer experience has been transformed. Tortoise SVN operates under the right-click menu. Version files and folders will have a green icon overlay by default. After installing, a good idea is to configure a few details. The right-click menu offers two places that are tempting, Properties and Settings. You do not want to touch properties right away. Properties are used to fine-tune details about the repo in the current folder. Settings is what you want. This lets you configure Tortoise SVN across all repos. As a software developer, you might be worried about the overhead of Tortoise SVN. This is a valid concern, which we will address now. First of all, you can limit where Tortoise SVN is active. Under Settings, Icon Overlays, you can say which paths to exclude and which paths to include. The icon overlays are maintained by a background program, tsvncache.exe. If you look in Task Manager, you will see it running. Every once in a while, you may find slow performance on some systems. 
if you see TSVN cache using significantly more than 0% of your CPU, just end task it. Nothing terrible will happen if you end task it. It will restart itself. There is one more detail worth configuring inside Tortoise SVN, and that is to hook in an optimal diff viewer. You do not need to do this on day one, but it is highly recommended. We use Exam Diff Pro integrated with Tortoise SVN. All you have to do is provide the full path to the executable. Tortoise SVN takes care of calling it with the correct parameters. Okay, let's say you have Tortoise SVN installed. Next, we will run through the most essential subversion skills. The one skill that you absolutely must master in order to take advantage of source code stored in subversion is subversion checkout. That establishes a connection between your client side on your disk with your server side repo. The rest is icing on the cake. You will find it very helpful to memorize update versus commit. These two commands have different names in different version control systems. Update means get, pull, or download the changes from the server repo to your local disk. Commit means put, push, or upload the changes from your local disk to the server repo. Browse is not a formal command, but most hosts and tools give you some way to browse the code directly on the server. Okay, let's look at subversion checkout specifically. Each subversion command has a page in the free subversion book. You can find these easily online. The important thing to remember about subversion checkout is that you check out from source to target. Usually, in year 2018, source is a URL and target is a path on your disk. The slide shows some example subversion URLs. Different hosts have different patterns to their URLs. Generally, you will see the name of the host, then the name of your project, and soon after, the keyword trunk. Especially when you check out from GitHub, you need to make sure that you add slash trunk to their suggested URL so that you only get the active portion of the repo. By convention, subversion repos all contain trunk, tags, and branches. The purpose and use of tags and branches is very well documented. If you want less than the complete repo on your disk, you can continue past trunk and add a longer path. When you do that, you are making a connection to just a portion of the directory structure within the repo. You decide where to target the repo on your disk. If everyone on the team is extremely careful, you can use relative paths for everything in your Delphi project. Then you can target the project anywhere on any disk. Some teams decide to use certain paths for certain projects. That also works. In Windows File Explorer, it helps to show hidden files when you are learning subversion. You will always have a hidden folder named .svn located at the top of the directory tree when you set the target of your checkout. If you delete that hidden .svn folder, presto, your files will stop being versioned. Okay, in this example, we will be checking out files from svn.code sf.net, which is SourceForge, and we're taking files from the Zephod's map project, just as an example. And what you might notice about the paths here is that the local disk doesn't yet have a source subfolder. And something that's not completely obvious is that if you tell Tortoise to check out from a URL and you want to nest it down a couple of path levels, that's fine. It will go and create those for you. So you don't need to create any folders ahead of time. Many people think that GitHub works only with Git. You can actually check out files from GitHub using Tortoise SVN. You must add slash trunk to the URL yourself as shown in this OmniThread library example. People who also like to avoid clutter on their disks might want to view the directory structure 
and contents of a repo before doing a checkout. This varies by subversion host, but generally there is a way to view the code of a project using just your web browser. On SourceForge, use the code tab of a project and then navigate through the directory tree. SourceForge gives you the checkout URL for the entire trunk. If you want fewer files, add the directory path as slash Zaphod's map slash source when forming your custom checkout URL. The Tortoise Subversion right click menu provides a way to peer directly into the content on the server after you have done a checkout. You just select Browse Repo from the right click menu and then get a cup of coffee while the details are downloaded into the dialog. How you prepare your coffee is your decision. Once the repository browser has opened, you will be able to see all folders, files, and revision numbers, author nickname, file size, and modification date. The repo browser operates slowly. Be patient with it. Take another sip of your coffee. If you need an extra copy of a file, you can download directly from the repo browser. Use the right-click menu on a file to see more options. As you probably know, there are two ways to set search paths on the Delphi IDE. You can set a global search path, or you can set a per-project search path. Here you see the disk of a Rubicon developer who has checked out source from three related subversion repos. One, Rubicon, two, TPAC, and three, Zephod's map. This is more Delphi source on disk than most developers would have, but it's useful for demonstration. Here you can see that the Rubicon project was checked out from the very top of the repo, instead of inside trunk. So when this is done, even the tags are visible or available on your disk. Whether this is good or bad depends on your purpose for using the source. Usually, one would check out from trunk or even further down the path. The Rubicon source is currently organized so that regular users only require the top path, Rubicon. Optionally, they can make use of other folders, Rubicon demos, Rubicon utilities, and other collections of files. In fact, trunk Rubicon source is the single required path. That gives all the database component bridge source for ADO, FireDAC, IB Express, and many other third-party vendors. Now looking at the icon overlay colors, you can see that the path files are versioned. They're green, but the DCU files have been ignored. They are white in the icon. Generally, people would end up having their DCUs in a more obviously temporary location, but this is fine to have them commingled because they've been ignored. Sanjay does a subversion update step to make sure he's on the latest revision. In this particular case, nothing has changed during his night, but now he knows for sure that he has the latest files. When repos have been checked out separately, you do have to update them separately. If this is too time-consuming to do manually, you can script a series of update steps from a simple batch file. In that batch file, you would just cd to each folder in sequence and run svn.exe update dot for each folder. Dot means the current folder, and I literally mean a period, a dot. In Delphi, there are two ways to set up search paths to take advantage of source from a repo. One, global search. Two, project search. Here we will see how Sanjay has set up global search. Note that he does not have any project open in the IDE when he does this. And these screens are taken with Delphi Tokyo. It does look a little different in Delphi Rio. The advantage to putting paths into the global list under Tools Options is that they will work across all your projects. Now, how do you know what path to use? 
What you want is the path to the Delphi source files. Those are the ones ending in PAS for Pascal. Now we will just open one of the Rubicon demos, one that uses the ADO bridge, and show that it does in fact compile and run using the source from the repo. Because the search path was set up globally, all those path files are found by the Delphi compiler and are available for use. This is especially important when you want to use the debugger and step into something. Having the Pascal source is much more convenient than just having a pre-compiled DCU file when you're debugging. It's fairly common for Delphi components to be provided at one price where you get DCU files for a particular version of Delphi like Rio and then at a different price when you get full source and that's the point at which you would be getting your Pascal files. Whether the component vendor provides that source through subversion or any other distribution method, you would still be customizing either the global search path or your project options search path in order to make use of that source when you're compiling and debugging your own projects. Okay. We have seen how to check out source code from a repo and how to use that source code in your own Delphi project. Next up, we will look at skills which come into play when you start modifying files and want to contribute changes back to the repo. There is one habit of successful subversion team players. Update frequently. Update every morning. Almost always you should update before starting to edit files in a folder. In general, you must update in coordination with your team so that you use whatever improvements other people have contributed. Updating is super easy. You just right click the parent folder of your repo and pick from the menu Subversion Update. When you update, assuming you have checked out the head revision, which always marches forward, you will get all the newest changes. Speaking of teams, what if you want to quickly find out which repo one of your version directories comes from? What if you do not want to wait for the browse repo dialog to open? You just want an immediate answer. All you have to do is open a command prompt at the folder whose repo URL you need. Use the subversion command line client, svn.exe. You can then copy and paste the URL out of Notepad and give that to colleagues who need to see the same files. ready to improve a file and save it back to the repo on the server, use subversion commit. The technique is very easy. Right click your file, then choose commit from the menu. If you right click a single file, you commit a single file. If you right click a folder, you have the choice to commit any changed files within that folder recursively. We are making progress. We have looked at the essential subversion commands that help you use source code contributed by other people. As we move on to more advanced skills, you will see more of Tortoise SVN in action. Coming up, file maintenance, how exactly to ignore certain files, and how to link repos with externals. At this point, we are giving advice based on what works best with Windows in year 2018. Maybe in the future, every task will work perfectly within the Tortoise SVN GUI. For now, you can save yourself a lot of grief if you stick to these guidelines. Use the regular Tortoise SVN client in Windows File Explorer for add, rename, and delete of individual files. Just use the GUI, then commit. However, when you want to delete entire folders, or when you want to move files, the best way is to use the Browse Repo feature.
Then you are operating directly on the server. When you finish adjusting files with the Browse Repo feature, remember that you need to run SVN Update to update yourself with your own changes. Using the Browse Repo feature is a bit rare and a bit advanced. There are some caveats worth mentioning. Note 1. In some cases, such as using a Windows guest inside VirtualBox, Windows might get confused when Subversion deletes folders. This confusion is temporary. After you reboot, Windows File Explorer will realize what happened and delay all your paths correctly. Note 2. If you delete an entire folder on the server, then update yourself. It is likely that Tortoise will mark lots of things red as if something has gone terribly wrong. To get out of this mess, all you have to do is revert at the parent. That will solve it immediately. We will talk in detail about the revert feature shortly. Now that we have the basic file operations out of the way, let's look at some of the version control features that will keep your team efficient. First up is subversion ignore. We recommend taking a few extra minutes to specify files to ignore because that avoids human error when there is stress to meet deadlines. Do you ever have deadlines? Yeah, we do too. It is really easy to ignore files if you already have them on your disk. Just right click the file and choose Add to Ignore List. Ignore rules become a property of the containing folder. We will show you what happens as you commit your ignore rules. Right after you commit an ignore rule, very often the Tortoise GUI will ask you to update. This is completely normal. The default choice is update. You should just use that. Just click update. The next thing that you will see is a confirmation about the update. That is also completely normal. All you have to do with that message is click OK. After that little detour, Tortoise Subversion will go back to your primary idea of committing the ignore rules. It will have remembered whatever message you wanted to use for the commit. Just click OK to reinitiate the commit. Then you are done. Subversion has a feature called externals which lets you define a link to a separate repo. Think of this in terms of a software dependency. Using externals, you can formalize a dependency on another software repo. You can automatically link the head of that repo or to a particular revision which you know works with your code. Sometimes the external repo will be hosted with a completely different host. That's fine. Your team will be able to get the files as long as they have a substitute username and password on that host. Once the externals appear on your disk, you can work with the files the same as with an independent repo. You can even commit changes back to the external repo. Let's look at a real example that is maintained by href tools. One of our products for Delphi is called Rubicon. It is a component suite for full text search. Rubicon depends on three outside resources. One, Zaphod's map source for XML configuration. That's open source on SourceForge. Two, some DUnit X helper files from a different path within the same Zaphod's map project and a tiny part of TPAC. Parts one and two are delivered via SVN externals as you will see in a moment. Part 3 is done by a manual copy of the necessary files to avoid overhead at present. In the case of Rubicon, there is a folder named Externals, which has the Externals rules defined. This is not a requirement. You can attach Externals to any path. We use that keyword as a reminder about how the repo is structured. <music>
possible to use the externals feature to copy in files within the same repo. An example on SourceForge is listed on the slide. The use case was where a single file from our TPAC product was needed in multiple outside projects. This technique lets those projects external in that single file without the overhead of the entire repo. There is one more major subversion command which can help when scripting the production of software releases. That command is export. Export is similar to update. Let's compare. Using update, you get the files for the head revision of a repo or of a specific revision from the past. Export, you get the same files. You specify the source and target exactly the same way, but there are important differences. With update, your disk will always have a hidden folder named .svn, which will contain information about your active connect to the source repo. With export, Subversion never makes that hidden folder. Now, imagine a week of time goes by. When you repeat your update step, you quickly download just the latest changes. If one file has changed, you get that one change quickly. When you repeat an export step, you download everything again big difference. And what if you change something? If you have done a checkout plus update, you are able to commit back to the repo. But if you have done an export, you cannot commit anything back. Thank you for sticking with us. We've covered a lot of material. Hopefully, it is all super useful for you and your coding career. In the next section, we will talk about subversion revert, diff, UTF-8, resetting passwords, and working with revision history. Subversion revert means to undo at a file level. For Delphi programmers, revert is especially helpful when you want to avoid making changes to DFM files, yet save changes to Pascal files. Tortoise SVN lets you know when files have been modified by giving you a red color to the icon. At that point, it is your decision. Do you want to commit your changes or revert them? Let's watch an example. some files and forgotten why. Subversion helps you to do your own code review. This works best if you have an excellent diff utility. We recommend ExamDiff Pro. Tortoise SVN includes its own free diff utility, but in our opinion, it is noisy and nowhere near as helpful as ExamDiff. This will be much easier to learn if you watch Subversion Diff in action.
2018. Every programmer knows that UTF-8 is a great format because unlike Windows ASCII from the 1900s, UTF-8 supports the letters of all human languages. Do you also know that UTF-8 files can and should start with a bomb? Here, bomb means byte order mark. It is a very short binary sequence which announces that the following data is in fact UTF-8, or for that matter, UTF-16. If you want the bomb preserved as people check out your file on different platforms, tell Subversion about the file type. All you have to do is indicate a mime type for your UTF-8 files. You do this by setting a property of the particular file. Tortoise SVN gives you a checkbox so you can have your usernames and passwords remembered. That's good. If your computer is stolen, that's bad. For various reasons, it's sometimes extremely helpful to force Tortoise SVN to forget one of your credentials. This is very easy as long as you know where to look. You start with a right click, of course. Then you go to Settings, Save Data. Look for Authentication Data. Once you find that, you can easily clear an individual credential or all of them. Here is a tip for anyone wanting to use Rue SVN as their host. Rue SVN has a generous policy whereby your first four repos are free forever for any given email address as long as you keep the file size reasonable. If you are thinking four free repos is not generous enough, I'll just use my 40 alternate email addresses to get endless free repos. Well, that will backfire. It will backfire because Rue SVN has already realized that you might think this way. When your subversion URLs are made within their systems, the URLs are constructed in a way that makes it very inconvenient with multiple credentials. If you find yourself in that situation, you will need to use the Tortoise SVN feature of clearing your authentication data regularly. This menu choice, Show Log, takes a little effort to remember. The idea is that it shows you a log of all the messages people left when they committed. Show Log is surprisingly powerful. Yes, it shows you the log of messages. It also shows you exactly who committed a file when. If you right-click Individual Revision Lines, you will get the choice to download that particular revision or do an immediate dip against it. The screenshot here shows history of one file, rbbase.pass. You can also ask for show log of an entire folder, and that tells you what has been changed recently for the whole directory recursively. When you have projects going on for more than a few weeks, show log becomes extremely valuable for management and collective memory. Now, some tips about how to manage the inevitable collection of large binaries. Amazon offers simple storage solution S3, which is ultra reliable and ultra affordable. You can also store files on a wide range of cloud service providers, including Google Drive, Microsoft OneDrive, Dropbox, and of course your own corporate network. For Rubicon, we deal with a set of three sample databases which need to be available in every major database format, from Access to Interbase to Oracle, because the whole point is to demonstrate full text search across a large data set. Our current solution is to store these database samples on S3 with CloudFront. We then make the files available to customers by giving them a PowerShell script, which downloads the file from the bucket and stores it in a suitable local folder. This works easily because the large binaries can be kept public. When you have confidential large files, of course you have to be more careful and use a more complicated system to keep out prying eyes and bots. One of the big advantages to involving PowerShell is that the scripts themselves are reasonably easy to run and they are plain text and very small. That means the PS1 files themselves can be versioned. The next slide will give you some PowerShell syntax to consider. In this example, we are downloading the Firebird SQL Client DLL for Win32 
from an archive on S3 that Ahrefs Tools maintains separately from the main Firebird project. It is just a copy of the DLL file, nothing special. The PowerShell syntax is fairly simple. Then you just define the source URL of the large file to download and the destination file on the local disk. Invoke Web Request does the actual work of downloading. This is a great way to handle a small number of large files. If you have more files, another option to consider is the AWS command line utility, which has a sync capability. You use that copy or sync directly from S3 to a local folder using secure credentials. You may have other ideas about where and how to store your large files. Great. The main thing is to avoid forcing them into subversion. We have reached our final and most challenging topic. Conflicts are a part of life. Anticipating them and having a strategy for resolution takes away the panic. In this section, we will talk about how you deal with the occasional but likely situation where the same file has been edited in two different ways. Whose code changes take effect? How do you cope? As you will see momentarily, dealing with file contention is very time consuming and distracting. Ideally, divide up the work and separate units so that each person in each time zone can work on separate files. Although Tortoise SVN does implement file locking, we have found it to be more efficient to plan to work on separate files, ideally on separate folders. The quote on the screen is from the excellent blog post about subversion versus Git. It boils down to the fact that renaming and moving are the most troublesome actions. When you have to do that, do that in the trunk. Tranquila. Do you watch Netflix? Have you ever noticed how many situations this versatile Spanish expression applies to? Tranquila, to ratchet a mobster down a notch, and whenever the blood is just about to boil over with frustration. In software development, this moment usually happens at 2 a.m. when you think you just finished your work and you are stuck with subversion conflict error messages. The first thing to be aware of when you have some annoying dialogue that refuses to solve itself is that you can always exit Tortoise SVN and delete the hidden .svn folder. Then recheck out on top of your existing files. All that will happen is that Tortoise SVN will review every file and mark it green or red depending on whether it already matches the head revision. You can then revert or commit file by file. Another way out is to temporarily rename your own files, accept the changes from the server repo, and then merge your changes line by line. Calmly. Basically, do not feel that you always have to let subversion lead you. Sometimes, you have to step outside its suggestions and lead. Subversion integration has been in the Delphi IDE for a while now. Have you ever tried it? In the final video clip, we intentionally set up a coding conflict where two people are editing the same unit. We do this on one system by checking out the project twice, once for Mike in USA and once for Sanjay in India. Believe it or not, it's actually quite common to cause your own conflicts when you have to reuse code shared across projects. So let's watch now as our mini team of two people get themselves into and back out of trouble.
Now that we have seen a conflict and a way to resolve it with careful use of diff tool, let's look at the final advanced skill. People writing about subversion often mention tags and branches. The words tags and branches simply refer to a URL path, like trunk, typically kept at the top of each repo. When you must work on patching something outside the head or mainline path, you can create a branch and work there. And when you have finished a release worth saving, you can tag your release. What the verbs tag and branch mean is, you can use subversion copy command to copy a set of files to a particular target on the server. The target path would rather be under tags or under branches. We usually do this with a Windows bat file that carefully uses the svn.exe command line client. The syntax is simple, svn copy from source to target. The reason you tag a release is because you imagine a future when someone might need to work with your current files exactly as they are. That person in the future will be able to check your tag and start working immediately. Now, can you tell your friends what Subversion is? Can you remember the name of the software you'll need to install to get started? Hint. It has something to do with turtles. Many thanks to the photographers who made their work available on Flickr and allowed commercial use. No turtles were harmed during the making of this video. Thank you so much for watching. We wish you total success with your projects.